Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Again, welcome to Through Portugal and Northern Spain, a webinar brought to you by Architectural Adventures. My name is Hasti Hijazi. I'm Director of Education at AIA Global Innovation Department, and I'll be conducting today's webinar. Before we get started, just a, a few housekeeping uh, uh, things for our attendees. This webinar will be recorded and you will receive the webinar recording along with the brochure of the Portugal and Northern Spain itinerary after today's webinar, so please stay tuned for that. I do have uh, attendees currently muted, but at the end of the session, you please let me know using the chat function if you have any questions, and I'll be happy to answer what I can and also forward any questions you have to Cindy Linnell, and her contact information will be at the end of the presentation, and so you'll know where to direct inquiries about the trip after today's session. The dates for the trip are October 6th through the 22nd, 2017, and today we're going to have a conversation with the subject matter expert who's going to be leading the trip on behalf of Architectural Adventures, Elizabeth Emerson. Before we get started with that, I wanted to start the webinar with just a little bit of fun um, for today. I'm going to mm -hmm. launch a poll um, that you're going to see on your screen, and you should see it now. It's regarding um, a question about one of Antonio Gaudi's works. So if you don't mind, take a moment and answer the poll. It's a tough one, huh? Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. Thank you all so much for participating. So uh, we had about 71% of the attendees did get the poll uh, question correct. Um, the answer is that it is still under construction. So Gaudí's work, La Sagrada Familia, it's a large Roman Catholic church in Barcelona. And Gaudí had committed the last 15 years of his life to this project and is actually buried under a crypt in the building. Um, the construction began in 1882, and it is still ongoing. It is not yet complete. Anticipated completion date is 20. 26, believe it or not. Uh, so thank you all for participating. I hope that was a fun piece of trivia before we get started um, with our webinar. So with no further ado, I wanted to talk a little bit about architectural adventures um, and our tours before we get started speaking about this trip in particular. So Architectural Adventures is uh, the official travel program of the American Institute of Architects, and we specialize in the exploration and appreciation of the world architecture, of course. So what we do, um, we work with the best in-class business-to-business education travel companies and tour operators on our trips, and we will build or select a prepackaged tour that fulfills our vision. The, um, the approach to the travel is that we have small group travel. Our tours have less than 36 people, and the tours welcome all traveler types. Um, so you don't have to be a practicing architect, of course, just have an appreciation for architecture and want to participate on a trip like this with like-minded travelers. Through Architectural Adventures, you're going to participate in special excursions. You'll get exclusive behind-the-scenes access and get insider knowledge to the popular sites, as well as lesser-known architecture. All of our tours are led by subject matter experts that are chosen by us to uh, provide lecture and um, 
uh, lecture on the architecture and for AIA members our tours are eligible for AIA learning units. This particular itinerary for Spain and Portugal is worth 27 and a half AIA learning units, six are, of which are HSW. Again this is just applicable if you do happen to be an AIA member um, you will get uh, continuing education credit for participating in this travel. But for everyone uh, who is participating, you get to enjoy the educational guidance and commentary regardless of whether you need learning units or continuing education um, for, uh, on behalf of your uh, profession. The subject matter expert for this trip is Elizabeth Emerson, AIA. Elizabeth is the founding principal of L Studio. It's an architecture firm based in Washington, D.C. and New York City. So first off, Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here and talk to us about this itinerary and, of course, for leading the trip. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone, and uh, thanks Hasi for making this happen. Um, this is pretty cool. This is the first time I've done a webinar, so this is a whole new technology group. Um, yeah, I, I started Elf Studio 10 years ago now with my business partner. Um, we are both uh, practicing architects and educators, and um, I had the pleasure of taking a group for an extended um, residency stay in Lisbon in 2011 and then um, did a shorter sort of mixed architecture group, sort of mixture of students and practitioners in, in the fall of 2012. So I'm really excited to be going back to introduce you to some of my favorite sites and hopefully um, also introduce you to some um, practicing architects working in the area today so you can hear what it's like to be a, a contemporary practitioner. Wonderful. Well, with that, let us go ahead and get started um, right into the itinerary. So I'm going to go through every day of the itinerary, and um, we'll talk a little bit about which, what attendees uh, can expect to view from each day. Um, and Elizabeth will also be talking about some of the sites we can expect to see as well. So, of course, day one um, of the 17-day itinerary, you're going to depart your gateway city for Lisbon, Portugal. On day two, uh, you arrive in the Portuguese capital in Lisbon, and you're going to check into the five-star Corinthia Hotel. So you see a uh, photo, an image of the Corinthia Hotel on your screen, um, and you can learn a little bit more online um, about the hotel. There is no structured sightseeing today, so you get you can rest and replenish and venture into the city at your leisure. Now, day three, we're going to explore the treasures of Lisbon. So, in the morning of this day, we'll visit two UNESCO World Heritage sites, beginning with the majestic Geronimos Monastery. So, this is one of the foremost examples of Portuguese late. Gothic Manueline style of architecture. And it's actually the final resting place of explorer Vasco da Gama. So Elizabeth, can you tell us a little bit about the Geronimos and what we can expect to see on this day? Sure, sure. So um, the Geronimos Monastery is located in Belém, which in the 17th century was actually a, a whole separate town from Lisbon. Lisbon was obviously a much smaller city at that point. Um, and that, that first slide you saw is a photo of the cathedral in Lisbon, which is at the top of one of Lisbon's seven hills, sort of like Rome, it's got seven hills. And um, it's in the Alfama neighborhood, which is the original, um, the original, original sort of uh, city, Moorish city, and then um, the city grows from there. Uh, Belém was a town sort of on the outskirts going further, um, well, let's say further out, closer to the ocean. So. Lisbon is situated on the Tagus River, which is when you're in the city, it looks almost like you're on the ocean because it's very, very wide. Um, but the lane is actually downstream. And so this was the, the monastery that was um, sponsored by the, the king. And for the explorers, this was the closest that their deep water vessels could go into the city. So that's why it became the last stop for the explorers. Uh, they would gather here, you know, a week or so before their um, expedition was set to alight, and they would be um, housed in the monastery, and they would 
have their parting prayers there, and um, and there would be a vigil held there until they returned or news of their um, their trip was was returned to the monastery. So it's it's really beautiful. The Manuelin style is super unique to Portugal. It's full of nautical uh, imagery of twisted ropes and seashells and barnacles and things that are really very specific to the unique kind of coastal culture and uh, climate of, of Portugal. It sounds like it's a wonderful way to start the trip. Yes, beautiful views as well, beautiful views out to the ocean. Great. So on day four, we'll be leaving Liz Lisbon, and we head north. And we stop in a small walled town of Obidos for a walking tour of its medieval streets and squares. A little bit of history about Obidos. Um, the Romans and Moors had settlements here until Portugal's first king took over in 1148. So very old uh, medieval uh, squares here. We'll also continue on to the seaside village of Nazare for lunch and leisure on this day. Uh, legend holds that the Virgin Mary rescued a knight from a fall here in the 12th century. And the chapel he built to commemorate this still stands on the cliffs. So lots of uh, great stories to go um, with these towns as well. We'll spend the evening in Oporto. This is uh, Portugal's second largest city and one of Europe's oldest urban centers. And uh, today, Oporto is the headquarters of the port wine industry and a city famed for its many stately bridges. Do you have any comments about this day? I know it's a lot to cover. Yeah, I, I would say um, one really exciting thing about Nazare. I have not actually been to Nazare yet myself because uh, um, usually I'm on a train heading directly to Oporto from Lisbon. But Nazare is um, one of the locations of the world's tallest wave, so that they have the highest recorded wave there at 110 feet high. Um, so it's really just a spectacular coastline. It'll be a beautiful place to stop for lunch, and there may be a surfing competition on while we're there. You never know. Well, that would be great to see. <laughs> So day five, we continue a day in Oporto. Today we're going to tour Oporto, stopping at the renowned Balao Market for local delicacies and continuing on to the historic city center. In the historic city center, we'll see the Grand Romanesque Cathedral, the neoclassical Stock Exchange Palace, and the Manueline-style Church of Santa Clara. So Elizabeth, what can you tell us more about Oporto? Oh, Porto is a super interesting city. So I think of a Porto a little bit like the um, the, the New York to Lisbon's Washington or or something like this. It's um, you can feel a slightly more northern European influence in the Porto. The climate changes um, as you make your way up the coast. Lisbon is is very sort of warm and bright and pastel and sunny, and a Porto has a little bit more of the the color of, of say France. Um, but it's a beautiful city. It's uh, located really on a quite a, a steep slope, heading down to the, the river. And then the, the town that's across the river, Villanova de Gaia, is where all the port houses are. So you can um, sort of take in the view while you taste your port, which I highly recommend we all do. Um, and it's also, interestingly, the center for contemporary architecture. They have an excellent architecture school in Oporto. Um, they've produced in the city two Pritzker Prize winning architects in the last, uh, say, 25 years, and just really amazing contemporary architecture. I'm not sure what our free time will be like in Oporto, but um, hopefully we'll have a little bit, and I can show you some of my favorite contemporary buildings while we're there. The colors really uh, stand out in this image alone. So I, I know you mentioned mm -hmm. it's a very colorful town. I can, I can see that just from the image. Okay, great. Well, uh, day six, we're going to journey on to Spain today. Um, and we will be going to the Santiago de Compostela. And that's the final stop on a pilgrimage route of the Way of St. James, traveled by thousands of pilgrims for 1,200 years. And it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. First, we will stop in the old Galician town of Pontevedra. And we'll take a walking tour of its historic city center. 
In recent years, Pontevedra has transformed itself into one of the most accessible European cities and has been widely awarded for its urban quality. And we'll be continuing on to arrive in Santiago in the mid-afternoon. And we'll check into the Parador de Santiago de Compostela, an upscale five-star hotel that occupies a former Pilgrim's Hospital built in 1499. So that's how we'll start the journey into Spain. Day seven will be a day in Santiago de Compostela. Uh, this is one of Spain's most beautiful and visited cities. Uh, today's tour will begin with the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela, featuring the silver crypt believed to hold the remains of St. James, one of Jesus' apostles. So Elizabeth, what can you tell us about this day? What can we expect here? Oh man, Santiago is one of my favorite cities. So I was one of those crazy pilgrims. <laughs> At least I walked a portion of the way to St. James in um, a couple of years ago. I left, I walked the last 100 kilometers. Um, and the, the pilgrimage nature of the city just gives it a completely unique and distinctive quality. You will see people arriving with backpacks and staff that look like they've been walking for at least a month. Um, the building where we're staying, uh, which was the Hospital of the Kings, is just magnificent. It's, it's really beautiful and the cathedral is, sort of defies description. You can only really <laughs> um, describe it if you've seen it, but it's, it's really beautiful. It's um, full of interesting heritage and there's also a very interesting contemporary cultural center too um, across the, uh, on the other side of town. So uh, I guess sort of schedule depending, maybe we could visit there as well. That's a, a building by Peter Eisenman. Also a very, very interesting building. Great. Day eight will be a day in Lyon, so we'll be leaving Santiago in the morning and we travel east to Lyon, and that's another stop on the way of St. James known for its religious festivals and Easter week processions. The afternoon tour includes the 13th century Lyon Cathedral and Casa Botines, a modernist building designed by Antony Gaudi. Elizabeth, what can you tell us about Lyon? Oh, Lyon's cool. It's, it's, um it's a really vibrant city, despite being small. It almost feels like a, like a university town, although I don't think there is a university there. But it's it's just very thriving, very active. Um, it has a really different quality than Santiago because it's uh, out on the plain. So where Santiago has a very coastal um, kind of green, lush vibe, Leon has a you really feel like you're sort of out on the, the Spanish plain. Um, so the topography is quite different. It makes a, a different quality in the architecture as well. Okay, great. This brings us to day nine of the uh, itinerary. Today we're going to stop in the Spanish port city of Santander. Uh, it's situated on a beautiful bay. You're going to be taking a walking tour. You'll see Santander's beautiful beaches, the Cape of Cabo Mare, and with its cliff top vista, an iconic lighthouse, and the renowned gardens of Magdalena Palace. After lunch in Santander, we'll travel on to Bilbao, an industrial port city on the Bay of Biscay, best known for its Frank Gehry-designed Guggenheim Museum, an architectural marvel of titanium, glass, and limestone. Well, first off, Elizabeth, can you give us a little bit of history about Bilbao? Uh, well, Bilbao is uh, was a more industrial city. I mean, it has medieval origins, but it really expanded in the 19th century as uh, an important place of production on the, the northern coast of Spain. So we're now sort of up um, looking out over, um, you know, towards France, let's say, through, over the Bay of Biscayne. Um, so it was famous for its port. It was famous for its, really, its deep water port, not the wine. <laughs> and, um, and so its industrial waterfront was really um, something to behold. The Guggenheim itself is situated right in the midst of that waterfront. So like many industrial cities of the 19th and early 20th century, um, the shipping center has moved further out of the city as the ships have gotten larger um, and with containerized shipping. So the, the um, part of the port that was right in the middle of the city had sort of gone into disrepair. So the city has commissioned several cultural buildings, and the, the biggest of these is the Guggenheim, to revive their waterfront and to make it a destination once again. And it's really become the heart of the city. And of course, the Guggenheim is a destination, not just you know for Europe, but globally. And it's, um, it's, it's 
magnificent jaw-dropping building. It's, it's really it's a Baroque building, um, and it's great fun to visit. And I'm looking forward to being there again. Great, which brings us um, to the next day, day 10, more of Bilbo and the Guggenheim. So this morning's tour begins along the cobbled streets in the medieval old town of Bilbo. Uh, we'll see the Cathedral de Santiago and the Plaza Nueve, Nueva, uh, the new plaza, a monumental square built in neoclassical style in 1821. We'll visit Rabira Market in Art Deco Gem from 1929, and the rest of the day is devoted to the arts with a trip uh, to the world-renowned Guggenheim that you mentioned, um, and we'll be looking at, we'll marveling at its design and explore its avant-garde 20th and 21st century collections. Um, anything else you'd like to mention um, about our time here? I'm really looking forward to seeing, it, it's a very uniquely sited building. It's sort of built on a half natural, half constructed site. So when you walk out, um, you don't realize it, but you're really out sort of, not in the middle of the river, but you're pretty far out in the river, but the, the kind of landscape of the building in, envelops the whole space. So I'm excited to see that again. I'm also excited to see what they've got going in this one gigantic gallery that they built that sort of dips underneath the famous um, iconic bridge that connects the two sides of the city. It was originally designed with a Richard Serra sculpture in mind, uh, which was there when I saw it. Now it's been probably 10 years since the last time I was um, at the Guggenheim, and I'm wondering if it's still there, which is a real treat if it is, or if they have something else in that gallery. But either way, it's, it's sure to be an amazing visit. It looks spectacular. So day 11 will be in Basque country. So today we venture into the countryside of Spain's Basque region. Uh, so we'll leave urban behind and go to the country. We'll be stopping first in Gornica. And Elizabeth, if you could tell us a little bit about what we might be seeing and also about a certain work of art that is there. Yes, so Guernica became famous during the Spanish Civil War. It was the site of a German air raid, actually, um, which was um, uh, the, I guess we would call them the fascist government of Spain, requested uh, German assistance in controlling this part of Spain, which was a Republican stronghold. Um, and so the Germans bombed the city of Guernica well, it's really a town, um, and that they're really high casualty rates without warning, and it was a lot of women and children. And so Pablo Picasso, um, as a protest, the next day, painted this very famous painting called Guernica, and it's the one that you can see on the slide there in the tile. Um, I believe that the original painting is still in the town, um, and I think just in general this town has a, a very prominent place in the, the kind of historical memory of, of 20th century Spain. Uh, so it'll be interesting to visit. I have not been there yet myself, so this is going to be a treat for me as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Day 12 will be Pamplona. So we'll be uh, traveling to Bielsa in the Pyrenees today, stopping en route in fabled Pamplona. We've all heard very much for uh, We've all heard of Pamplona, famous for the annual Enciero, better known as the running of the bulls. Elizabeth, what can you tell us about Pamplona and the running of the bulls? I've read so much about it. <laughs> well, I've never run with the bulls myself. I can't, I can't <laughs> claim to have. I, I have it on good authority that um, it's actually kind of nicer to be there when they aren't having the running of the bulls because you can <laughs> see the city more. Um, so I think we're in for a treat. Um, I have not been to Bielsa, so this will be a, a new adventure for me as well. Um, this part of Spain, though, is, of course, rich in history and lots of cultural traditions. So I'm sure we'll get a taste of it, even if we're not there for the bulls. You make a great point, and I'm sure it's a lot quieter and a lot uh, more so yes. you can sightsee more. <laughs> when. Yeah, apparently the, during, the, during the running the bulls, it's, um, it's chaotic, to say the least. <laughs> it might be a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> Okay, so day 13. On day 13, we'll take a break from the city and we're going to enjoy the fresh mountain air and stunning scenery 
will visit Ordesa y Mont Perdido National Park, the 56,000 acre UNESCO Biosphere Reserve looks incredible. It was established in 1918. Uh, it is Spain's oldest and one of Europe's first national parks. Um, its dramatic glacier-carved landscape provides habitat for over 170 bird species and 32 mammal species, including the endangered ibex. So we'll be touring by smaller vehicles on this day. Uh, we'll be able to take in the beauty of the lush valleys, the blue streams, and the fir trees. Um, sounds like an amazing nature-filled day. The afternoon is free for us to hike or relax amidst the natural beauty. So it seems like we'll get a really good break um, and, and be able to appreciate some nature on this day. Day 14, so Bielsa to Barcelona. Uh, from Bielsa, we're going to travel to Barcelona. It's Catalonia's capital, Spain's second largest city, and one of the most visited cities on Earth. Arriving in the late afternoon, we'll check into the Hotel Avenida Palace and have time for dinner and exploration on our own. The hotel is located right in the heart of the city. and. Uh, it is renowned for its easy walkability, so we'll have some chance to explore on our own. Gems of Barcelona, my goodness. Uh, there's so much to, to do and see in Barcelona. So we're going to begin our tour here um, in the Gothic quarter of Barcelona. So it's a maze of charming medieval streets, squares, and mansions. We'll walk along the famous Las Ramblas. Uh, the tree-lined pedestrian mall before paying tribute to Barcelona's native son. We all know him, the renowned modernist architect Antony Gaudí. Uh, his designs just litter um, all over Barcelona. Um, so Elizabeth, what can you tell us about today and what we're going to see? Well, this is um, one of the things I think is really nice about this trip is that you're getting um, a taste of the regionalism of Spain. Spain is really a very regional country. The, the quality of the landscape changes considerably, the, the language changes, the food changes, and we're getting a nice survey of three different regions on this trip. Um, so Catalonia is quite quite different than the Basque country, um, but equally proud and you know equally rich in heritage. Uh, it's a beautiful city, Barcelona. I mean, the, the Gothic Quarter is beautiful. It also has a very important, from an architectural standpoint, um, urban plan of the 19th century, this district that um, was laid out sort of uh, comparable time period to Baron Haussmann in Paris and um, very influential worldwide. And then of course Gaudi, I mean you can't say enough about Gaudi, is highly singular, uh, quixotic, uh, imaginative architecture. It's, it's like no one else. <laughs> it's really, um, it's, a, it's a thing of its own. And then I'm not sure if it was this day or the next day. Um, there's also just a really thriving contemporary architecture scene in Barcelona. One of the things that is not to be missed is the Olympic grounds, which I think we'll probably do the next day. Um, there's some really important buildings there. Uh, and of course, Mies van der Rohe's famous Barcelona Pavilion, which is just a, a watershed moment for modernism in Europe. Wonderful, and that does bring us to the next day, which will be a free day in Barcelona. Uh, we can uh, do as we wish at our leisure. So, Elizabeth, what are some must-sees that you suggest uh, on this day? Yeah, so so the Olympic grounds um, and the uh, Barcelona Pavilion by Nice is, is right next to them. Um, there are some really interesting parks, two contemporary parks along the waterfront. Of course, there's just always the beach. One of the great things about um, Portugal and northern Spain is there are beautiful uh, coastal regions. And so, you know, lunch by the beach, you can't go wrong. Barcelona has such a fun, um, vibrant street life, street culture. You know, that stroll down the Rambles is, is really enjoyed by everyone, tourists and natives alike. And so, you know, a leisurely tapas lunch by the water is a perfectly legitimate way to spend the afternoon <laughs> in Barcelona if you're tired of, of running around looking at buildings. Um, that's a good that's a good thing to do as well. Great, and that 
sadly brings us to the last day of this amazing itinerary. On day 17, we depart Spain and we'll transfer to the airport this morning and take our flights back across the Atlantic back home, but with hopefully many great memories and stories and learning um, so much. I've already learned so much just from this 30-minute webinar, so Elizabeth, thank you so much uh, for being with us and giving us a little bit of a preview into what we might expect. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Can't wait for our trip. <laughs> So with any um, follow-up questions after today's webinar, please contact C Cindy Linnell at 1-800-293-5725. You can also reach her at travel at architecturaladventures.org. She can answer any questions you have about logistical hotels um, and any, any other um, items that you need to know about the trip. Again, I'll be sending you the PowerPoint from today as well as a link to the recording of today's webinar, and I'll also attach the trip brochure so you can see um, everything laid out. Um, I'll end the webinar here with our 2017 trip schedule from Architectural Adventures, and we'll be adding some itineraries for 2018, so uh, watch out for emails from us about uh, the exciting trips that are to come. So thank you all and for attending. Just, yes, Elizabeth? I think I'm just curious, is there time to take a few questions now? I'm not sure about the webinar setup, if that helps it, but or if that's we, possible, but is it possible for people to ask a few questions now? We are actually past the, um, oh, okay. the time for yeah. the webinar, but however, um, please contact Cindy as well if you have any questions for Elizabeth, um, specifically just on some of the history and some of the comments that she made about the itinerary. Um, we'll be happy to forward questions on to her, and then also we can handle any of the logistical questions that you might have. So with that, I'm going to thank all of you um, for attending. We hope you found this webinar um, helpful and enjoyable. Um, and again, please contact Cindy with any questions. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, we'll be looking forward to this amazing once-in-a-lifetime trip. So um, thank you all, and bon voyage, safe travels.